apologize for the delay. We didn't have the PowerPoint uh, in the right position. Just to let you know, the last two slides will have the text that I'm going to be using this morning and all of the quotations from Ellen White. I'd like to talk this morning about something very crucial, very interesting for Christians, especially at the end of time, called the Ministry of Waiting, or the Ministry in Waiting. I'd like to begin with a short story. It was early morning. The family was getting ready to start the day. Dad gulped his breakfast and announced that he was late for an office meeting. He slung his coat over his shoulder and headed for the front door. Seven-year-old Debbie called out from the top of the stairs, Daddy, Daddy, wait. I have to run by racing out the door. He was on his way. Debbie's mouth curled as if she was going to cry. She sauntered down the stairs, went to the kitchen where mother had prepared breakfast. The food didn't taste quite right, but the hurt was so deep, she called him on the phone. Daddy, you didn't kiss me goodbye. I'm sorry, sweetheart, that's okay, she said. Then she hung up the phone. She put on her jacket, slung a pack on her back, kissed her mother goodbye, went out the front door to head towards school. She had taken no more than a few steps when their car came into the driveway. It was Daddy. He got out quickly, lifted her up in his arms and kissed her. Debbie, my day will be better now too. He came home to give her a kiss. She had wanted Daddy to wait, but Daddy didn't have time. But then he decided he couldn't wait until the end of the day to see her. He made time and headed home. Have you ever had your heart crushed because someone didn't stay with you or wait for you when you wanted them to? I think that happens often with Jesus. He loves companionship. I suspect every day he cries out to each one of us, wait, wait for me, wait, you're in danger, wait, stop, you're sinning. A plan for waiting was built into the plan of redemption. The Bible tells us that the plan for Christ to suffer in our stead was laid even before the world was created, 1 Peter 1.20. It was just a plan then. Adam waited. Abraham waited. By faith he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God, Hebrews 11, 9 through 10. David waited and wondered. Ezekiel waited. Mary was told by Gabriel, heaven's most powerful created being, that she would have a son. His name would be Jesus. Gabriel even told Mary that with God, nothing shall be impossible, Luke 1, 37. She then entered a mysterious way. Jesus came. He would set up a kingdom that would never end. The Jewish people had been waiting, but when he arrived, they didn't recognize him, John 1, 11. They are still waiting. God's plan had a built-in 4,000-year wait. God craved that people would be excited when Jesus arrived, but few were. It is so interesting that Christ, the man, patiently accepted each redemptive step towards man's eternal future. Waiting for each phase to be completed was built into his plans. The journey to the cross was a series of progressive waits for him. Then came the Garden of Gethsemane. In ways we do not understand, God's presence began to be withdrawn, and guilt of sinful men began weighing on Christ's soul. The most difficult wait ever experienced began. He cried three times to have his lethal cup passed from him. He was crying, Father, can this wait? 
can this decision mission be done any any other way when he went to the three disciples and found them sleeping his heart's cry was wait can't you delay that sleep can't you relate to me as i say goodbye debbie's father came back for a touching moment but jesus father could not rescue him at this time isaiah 63 3 says i have trodden the winepress alone and of the people there was none with me for i will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and i will stain all my raiment then something terrible deepens christ's stress satan tempted jesus to wait the jewish nation is rejecting you your disciples will soon abandon you the sense of god's wrath isn't worth it he would soon face the wrath of the jewish leaders it's not worth it wait satan urged there is here a deep issue that is easy to overlook the plan of redemption was made by divine beings the decision to accept and become the incarnate jesus was made by a divine being the decision to go through this suffering the decision to die was made by the humanity of jesus mrs white notes the conflict was terrible the human heart longs for sympathy and suffering this longing christ felt to the very depths of his being in words we don't understand mrs white says that he suffered superhuman agony terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt there was another wait going on at this time it was by the heavenly beings and even throughout the universe what will the man jesus decide the humanity of the son of god trembled the words unfallen and the, the world's unfallen and the heavenly angels had watched with intense interest as the conflict drew to its close satan and his confederacy of evil the legions of apostasy watched intently this great crisis in the work of redemption the powers of good and evil waited to see what answer would come to christ's thrice repeated prayer angels had longed to bring relief to the divine sufferer but this might not be no way of escape was found for the son of god amazingly satan was urging him to abandon humanity god didn't say anything those three prayers went unanswered he waited until christ's decision was finally made christ knew who he was but it was the man who had to make the final decision to go to the cross he did finally make it for you and for me he craves your attention and affection don't wait this morning to give it all to him the question then becomes for each one of us will we accept what jesus had done yes or will we accept it no maybe billions maybe trillions maybe even more created beings dependent on one man two thousand years ago in the garden of gethsemane then bearing your guilt and mine looking now at the issue of christ's legal decision the plan of redemption is based upon substitutionary intention jesus was to take the sinner's place how by accepting that guilt by dying for man's sins second corinthians 5 21 says for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made righteousness of god in him second corinthians 5 21 
and he is the propitiation for our sins. He took our sins, he took our guilt, he took our punishment, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. First John 2.2. 2. What Christ did has meaning for everyone at all times on planet Earth. If my wife Jeannie hands me a gift, but I don't take it, does that change the actual gift? No. Does it change the value if I don't take it? No, but it remains worthless to me. Does that change the meaning of the gift? Not on Jeannie's part. Jesus' offering is the offering the most valuable gift in the universe. He's shouting, don't wait, please take it. What, when I do, then it becomes valuable to you. Then its meaning is eternal meaning. Then its worth is more than even my life itself. What Christ did opened the way for us to the very throne of God. A ladder was fixed between earth and heaven. It led up to that amazing possibility of eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, Romans 6, 23. We must accept the gift and fully commit to copying Jesus. Then suddenly that gift of grace begins a restoration process that never stops giving. That changing power is the Holy Spirit working for and in you angels ministering spirits who will do for you what you cannot do for yourselves are waiting for your cooperation they are waiting for you to respond to the drawing of christ draw nigh to god and to one another by desire by silent prayer by resistance of satanic agencies put your will on the side of god's will Looking now at a stunning imperative for Daniel to wait. Through amazing divine gifts, Daniel received understanding to Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. He was delivered from the lion's den. He was able to interpret the writings on the wall in Belshazzar's last or 13th year in 539 BC. But starting way back in Belshazzar's first year around 552 BC, something began to change in God's messages to Daniel. Daniel 7 was then given to him in night visions. This time things changed. Daniel acted emotionally. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Daniel 7.15 Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my own heart, Daniel 7, 28. Different translations describe Daniel's reaction as troubled me, alarmed me, disturbed me, even terrified me. What is happening? Daniel waited for three more years, before another supernatural contact from heaven came in Daniel 8. His questions were partly answered at that time. On Daniel's behalf, Gabriel asked Christ unique questions in Daniel 8.13. Finally, Daniel was informed in Daniel 8 that the divisions would not apply until the time of the end, Daniel 8.17. When God's wrath would intervene, verse 19, at an appointed time, verse 19. Then, as these descriptions were given, he was told to seal the visions and that they would have meaning only in a distant future. Despite some explanations from Gabriel and Christ, this is how chapter 8 ends. And I, Daniel, fainted. And with six certain days afterwards, I rose up and did the king's business. 
and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. The Net Bible said there was none to explain it. The NIV says it was beyond understanding. Daniel waited, and with troubled emotions, by 536 BC, the third year of Cyrus the Great, Daniel in third person language said, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision, Daniel 10.1. He accepted that the great meaning was beyond his day. He accepted a partial understanding. From Daniel there remained many prophecies in waiting. Only in the last two decades have they become clear to God's people. A wait for us of 2,500 years. Now let's look at a time of the end understanding. As the message of Christ's first advent announced the kingdom of his grace, so the message of his second advent announced the kingdom of his glory. And the second message, like the first, is based on the prophecies. The words of the angel to Daniel related to the last days were to be understood in the time of the end. That's you and I. At that time, Daniel wrote, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise will understand whenever has that kind of phraseology in prophecy the wise shall understand it means that we can eventually understand it many prophecies were in waiting until our day that's exciting the wise are those who have a firm link with god's spirit in heaven they will grasp the meaning of those prophecies that have been in waiting we have come to that time we understand now most of daniel 8 through 12. critical insights now from ellen white regarding waiting the slaying of the passover lamb was a shadow of the death of christ says paul christ our passover is sacrificed for us first corinthians 5 7 the sheaf of the first fruits, which at the time of the Passover was waved before the Lord, was typical of the resurrection of Christ. Paul says in speaking of the resurrection of the Lord and of all the people, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ, it is coming. Like the wave sheaf, which was the first ripe grain gathered for harvest, and that was barley. Christ is the first fruit of that immortal harvest that redeem ones, that at the first future resurrection shall be gathered in the garner of God. These types were fulfilled, Ellen White says, not only as to the event, but as to the time. On the 14th day of the first Jewish month, the very year and or day and month on which Fifteen long centuries the Passover lamb had been slain, Christ having eaten the Passover with his disciples, instituted that feast which was to commemorate his own death as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That same night he was taken by wicked hands to be crucified and slain, and as the antitype of the wave sheaf, our Lord was raised from the dead on the third day, the first fruits of them that slept. A sample of the re resurrection, just whose vile body shall be changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. Verse 12 in Philippians 3.21. In like manner, the types which relate, and this is a very important question, quotation we often skip over in Ellen White's writings. In like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled 
at the time pointed out in the symbolic services. Let me read that again. In like manner, the types which relate to the second advent, which we are looking forward to right now, must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic services. She orients Christ's second coming to the fall feast, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and we know from Leviticus 23, the Feast of Tabernacles. All this tells us that Jesus will come in the fall of the year. Why is all this important? The story of the Jewish feast represent messianic prophecies that are filled with information for us today. We wait for many things to occur, but even before the Sunday laws, our biggest wait, there, before the Sunday laws, there are many things that must occur, but our biggest wait is to see his face sometime in the soon fall of some year. A story now of something that was worth the wait. I may not be able to pronounce some of these Chinese names, but maybe Jack, Dr. Jack can help me out at another time. Jayamin was born in Singapore, a city-state in Southern Asia. She was 21 years old when this story began to unfold. Jayamin lost her father at age 13. Her life then became deeply committed to God. On her 21st birthday, she was alone, praying on a Singapore beach. She thanked God for his love providing for her family since her dad died. Then she promised God she would follow him all the days of her life. She would wait for a godly husband. She put a simple band on her left middle finger that she had a local craftsman make. It bore this message, waiting for you. She wore it daily, waiting for God to lead and waiting for that special man. She went on a mission trip for the second time on a large ship, Dulles, that spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in many countries. Over 350 international volunteers were on board. It was hard to leave her mother and family, but she committed to two years of service. Her heart ached, also leaving friends in the church. Many on board were married. They modeled for her the sacredness of marriage, the importance of faithfulness, forgiveness, and for love. She experienced many suitors, but no one was heaven bound, which she promised God that she would wait for. She waited. She committed to another two years. She was lonely. Finally, she returned home. She occasionally met potential someones that she was drawn to, but found they were always taken. She prayed, God, what about me? She cried often, especially at nighttime. She had this dream of marriage since age 21 when she began to wear that ring. Why this unfulfilled desire cut so deeply? Why did it bring such lonely hours at night? Do you think that Jesus even feels that way about you as he waits at times? Through it all, however, God's presence remained close to joy and mean. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. David said in Psalms 35, and she often prayed, God, bring me that morning. In a memoir, she noted this. I realized that even though marriage was a good gift from God, and notice the maturity of what she's saying here. I was desiring marriage so much to the point of making an idol of it in my life. I was seeking the gift and not the giver. 
I also doubted my worth and identity, fearing I was an incomplete as a woman until I became a wife or someone's mum. But I was wrong. As a child of God, I was already complete in Christ. His love had redeemed and restored me. And was that not enough? That led me to confess, God, I'm sorry for not being satisfied in you alone. I surrender my dream of marriage to you, whether I get married or not. You remain good. Help me to be content, to delight in you alone. My heart was, my heavy heart was lifted. And I believe this season of singleness was God's portion, his gift to me. She became employed at Operation Mobilization in their Singapore offices. They operated more than one ship to spread the gospel. Months went by. Then at the age of 29, a man by the name of Ming Hui came into the office. He applied for a short mission trip on the ship Lagos Hope, the Word of Hope. She was delighted in meeting a like-minded individual. His goal was Bible college, then full-time ministry. They enjoyed conversing together. He was warm in personality, adventurous in spirit, and gentle in nature. They became friends, and in time, they fell in love. Then courtship. Then she gave him that ring, waiting for you. This is the picture of this couple, Jiamin and Minghui. An astonishing wait for God, a tearing time, a question. Daniel had just received another vision about the little horn. It was a very painful vision in Daniel 8, 9 through 12. Gabriel and Christ are together as this vision ends. Gabriel asked several questions of Christ on Daniel's behalf and on our behalf. One crucial query that Gabriel made, how long will, the, will be the vision, the Hahazon vision, some of those of you that may know Hebrew, in Daniel 8.13, meaning when will this vision terminate? That's the little horn vision, really for the end of time. This is the ultimate question to the persecuted church and believers. It is really a pleading prayer for when divine deliverance or intervention will come. God, won't you limit the triumph of evil? The power of that little horn came from the north where Satan wants his power to be, Isaiah 14, 13. It's a power that wants to be like God. It magnified itself to the prince of God's people. Chapter 8, Daniel 8, verse 11. He took away the Sabbath, persecuted God's people, and removed the very place the church was to have for them. When will this end, Gabriel said? How long will it be? This will be a prayer of each one of us. Maybe it already is. Though there is a 2300 year prophecy in the next verse, verse 14, the actual answer to Gabriel's question in verse 17 and 19, which we already alluded to, is there to help us grasp. It's for our time. The evil of the little horn and its harm to God's people will be at the time of the end, at an appointed time. Scholars tell us that question, how long, is eschatologic. That means related to the time of Christ's second coming. Daniel is given a review session of his many prophecies, then in Daniel 11. Finally, the Antichrist or King of the North comes to its end in Daniel 11:45. The chapter break between Daniel 11 and 12 is really misplaced. The first four verses of Daniel 12 belong to chapter 11. 
Here is the end of the story graphically. The Antichrist ceases to exist. Christ stands up, that's in verse one of chapter 12. The great tribulation, God's people are delivered. Special resurrection, saints and special wicked resurrection. Saints understand and they're glorified. And then there's a sudden end. Everything is to be sealed to the time of the end. Daniel recognizes this sequence. Instead of wanting to know when the Antichrist activity will occur as Gabriel did, he wants to know something very interesting. When the great tribulation will end. No, when the deliverance of God's people and special resurrection will end. Daniel knows that when that occurs, evil will be history at that time. After several prophetic waymarks are given, Daniel is able to directly now talk to Jesus. That's in Daniel 12. And this is one of his questions. There it is again. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Daniel 12, 6. Wonders here refers to something supernatural that God has done, that Hebrew word. Daniel has just described a special resurrection and deliverance of God's people after a tense antichrist prophecy. That's Daniel 11, 34 to 30, 45. Jesus' answer, when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be accomplished. Daniel 12, 7, Part C. At the end of a three and a half year period of persecution, these wonders, the deliverance of God's people and that special resurrection, will have occurred. Evil will then be in the past. Now there's another how long prophecy. In Revelation, under the fifth seal related to the martyrs, they are symbolically crying out. They called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Revelation 6, verse 10. The answer came, they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be quilled as they are, will be fulfilled. Again, how long is eschatologic? But it's a cry from the hearts of God's people. The answer to all of these prayers and cry of how long is, wait, they will unfold just before Jesus comes. Ellen White says God's wants his people to, in these days to review the trials through which ancient Israel passed in order to learn how to prepare for the heavenly Canaan. Many look back to the Israelites and are amazed at their unbelief. They feel that they, that they themselves would not have been so ungrateful, but when their faith is tested even by little trials, they reveal no more faith or patience than ancient Israel did. The Israelites waited for their deliverance. We aren't sure how long from Egypt. They were persecuted much during this time, then finally came the ten plagues. They too wondered how long. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The very atmosphere is polluted with sin. Soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials, perhaps even more than ancient Israel. And the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. They won't wait or endure. Instead of being strengthened and confirmed by opposition, threats and abuse, 
they will cowardly take the side of the opposers. The promise is, them that honor me, I will honor. 1 Samuel 2.30 Our challenge here this morning, the remnant are not prepared for what is coming upon the earth. Stupidity like lethargy seems to hang upon the minds of most of those who profess to believe that we are having the last message. Get ready, get ready, get ready, Ellen White says, for the fierce anger of the Lord is soon to come. Incidentally, that is the third angel's message that we will be broadcasting, and that's about God's wrath. His wrath is to be poured out unmixed with mercy, and ye are not ready. Rend the heart and not the garment. A great work must be done for the remnant. Many of them are dwelling upon little trials. You suffer your minds to be diverted too readily from the great work of preparation and the all-important truths of these last days. Between my sophomore and junior years of college, I worked for a building contractor. That summer, we constructed a large hangar at a local airport in Richmond, Indiana. The cement had to be eight inches thick. Building inspectors would take samples, dry them out, and in a non-disclosed laboratory, put the core under progressive pressure. It had to be very hard and tough. If it withstood a certain stress, it passed the building code. There is a laboratory that God has set up, highly individualized, that tests how strong our faith is. Our faith is to be strong. It will withstand the end time stresses. That is so important. Its quality and strength will determine if we will be happy living with angels, Christ, and all of heaven forever. It will answer a final question. Can you really trust God in everything? God wants us to be excited with our friendship, even though he hasn't yet come to sweep us up in his arms. Well, the ministry of waiting is profound. For a little girl wanting a kiss from her daddy. For Abraham looking for a city whose builder is God. For those who fail to understand the weight prophecies the Jewish people. For the failed weight of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. For the terrible weight temptation Christ experienced as demonic forces tried him to put him off the cross. For the emotional challenge of a prophet like Daniel to receive a prophecy and not be told what it meant, but that he must wait. For our wait for a fall return of Jesus. For the precious wait in faith for a God-oriented spouse like that young lady. Finally, the cry, how long? that all of God's people will have while waiting under stress and pain and heartache till it will end. David said in Psalms 37, those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God is waiting for you. Are you waiting for him? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, this morning as we wait for you to come once again, we also wait and plead that the Holy Spirit will work in our hearts to prepare us for that wonderful, wonderful time when we will see Jesus coming in those clouds. I pray, Lord, for each one that has tuned in here this morning that 
your spirit will strive with them, that they will not wait putting off a full commitment to you, and that each one will discern that it's worth it all to prepare for heaven, no matter what sacrifice, no matter what stress, even though we might cry out how long, we will know deep in our hearts that it'll all be worthwhile. Bless us now as we end this service this morning. Be with us, give us courage, and give us growing hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.